Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jamie Terrell. I lead the marketing communications here at Salt Marsh. Uh, we're very happy to have you all here with us this afternoon for the next topic in our weekly webinar series. We've been doing these uh, for several weeks now, and today's session is all about you, our healthcare clients. So um, today we're going to hear from our healthcare leadership team, Andrew Kent, Claudia Ryan Gruber, and Al Grimes are here with us today uh, to talk about the CARES Act provider relief funds and key aspects of the terms and conditions for that funding. So I understand that there's quite a bit to cover and I don't wanna to take too much time. So let's um, just start with a few quick housekeeping items. First, we've gone ahead and muted everybody. Uh, mentioned that a few minutes ago for the presentation. We will have some time toward the end today for some Q&A. Um, so feel free to unmute yourselves at that point. If you do have questions during the presentation, feel free to share them in our meeting chat. I'll be monitoring what comes through and we'll hold those questions for the end uh, for Q&A. We're also recording today's presentation, so you'll receive a copy of the recording along with a copy of our slides. So be on the lookout for that tomorrow. Uh, you can always also find those materials on our COVID hub on our website. I know a few people have reached out to us and have not received those follow-up emails. So you know, always feel free to reach out to us so we can help figure out what the problem may be, but you can always access uh, these webinar materials and other helpful information on our, our COVID resource hub. You go to our website, there will be a big red bar at the top of the screen, it'll take you right there. Um, so in that same email with the follow-up materials, you'll see a, a link to complete a short survey that should only take just a minute. And we really do appreciate the feedback to improve our events. These webinars are relatively new for us. Um, so we're certainly looking for ways to improve. And if this is a format that you enjoy, please take a moment to let us know that. It's really helpful for us. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and introduce Andrew Kent, uh, shareholder and leader of our firm's healthcare consulting practice. Andrew. Thanks, Jamie. And good afternoon, everybody, all our, all our watchers out there in, in the virtual world. Appreciate y'all showing up for our webinar this afternoon. So as Jamie said, the subject today is the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund. Um, we're going to try to cover what we know today about the attestation, documentation, and reporting obligations. Um, you know, one caveat you'll probably hear us say throughout the entire presentation is this is a rapidly changing environment. Um, just for example, the frequently asked questions from the Department of Health and Human Security have been updated twice in the last two days. Um, we had an update on the 19th and we had another update on just yesterday evening. So we're trying to bring you the most current information today, um, but uh, we are dealing with a, a rapidly changing environment and there are things we don't know yet. We're going to touch on uh, some of the aspects today that are still unknown, particularly with regards to the ultimate reporting obligations for these funds. Um, very quickly about our firm. Uh, Salt Marsh is a, roughly 150 professionals, five offices in Florida and Tennessee. We're a 75 year old firm, um, CPA led accounting and consulting firm with uh, focuses in financial institutions, healthcare, um, construction, manufacturing, and uh, financial advisory. We are a member of the BDO Alliance. We're an independent member of the BDO Alliance, which means that we have access to a lot of BDO's resources. BDO is a worldwide CPA firm, and uh, we often have, have made very good use of that in the healthcare space. So our agenda for today. So once again, we're gonna give an overview of the CARES Act COVID-19 relief funds. Um, we're going to talk about the general distribution funds, the targeted distribution funds, and the other various CARES Act relief funds. We're gonna be talking about the terms and conditions, the attestation requirements and the documentation requirements, um, the reporting obligations that we know are coming down the, the pipe. And then as Jamie said, we're going to try to make sure we take some time at the end for some questions and answers. So an overview of the CARES Act relief funds. Um, 
this is where we're going to spend our time today, uh, the, specifically the CARES Act Provider Relief Funds, but there are a couple other programs that are generally in the same bucket. You've got the Medicare Accelerated and Advanced Payment Program. You've got the suspension of the Medicare 2% sequestration. You've got the various loan programs, some through the SBA, some directly through Treasury, and these include the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, also referred to as the EIDL loans or EIDL loans, the Payroll Protection Program or PPP loans, and the Market Street Loan Programs. We're not going to get into too much in depth on these various other loan programs today, um, though we may touch on some of the interrelation between, for example, payroll protection loans and the CARES Act Provider Relief Funds. The focus today is going to be on the CARES Act Provider Relief Funds and that $100 billion allocation. And to start us off talking about that, I'm going to turn it over to Claudia Reingruber. Claudia? Hi, thank you very much. Um, the initial uh, distribution of funds related to the CARES Act um, were general distributions, and those were those began to be distributed um, in uh, around April 10th of 2020. There are 100 billion dollars that are included in this general uh, in the funds that are going to be released uh, to healthcare providers under the Provider Relief Funds. 50 billion dollars of those are general distributions, the ones that we have uh, received most of us already. And then there will be another $50 billion in targeted distributions. And some of those uh, distributions have already been defined and um, we can touch on those briefly, but there are still going to be some amounts that um, the government has not yet decided how or uh, entirely how they're going to distribute those amounts. I think one thing that's very important is that these funds are grants. Okay, okay, I, I got it now, right, I got it now, thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sounds like a connection problem there a little bit. But uh, so the first $50 billion um, that were released were general distributions. And these it's very important to realize that these are grants, not loans. That's a common question that we get. And um, as, as federal grants uh, are, there are certain uh, uh, terms and conditions that come along with that grant money from the federal government. And if you comply with those terms and conditions, then those grants do not have to be paid back. And uh, with the intent of helping all of you in the healthcare sector um, survive this difficult uh, initial onset of COVID and hopefully um, be able to <clears throat> provide the funds that are necessary going forward. So the funds, the, the restrictions or the requirements for these funds are they they are to be used to, and this is an exact quote from the law, to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. There's another restriction that says um, that you cannot, in effect, double dip, so that whatever funds you may get from PPP, um, uh, the payroll protection program, or you get from other grants or other um, relief funds that are available, either at a federal, state, or local level, you're not permitted to um, double dip or to take funds from different programs, relief funds, and apply them to the same set of expenses. I, I you know, that's just an important thing to remember, but I think many of you will feel like you're not going to have any trouble finding um, support for lost revenues and for additional expenses that you're incurring in, the, uh, in connection with this COVID pandemic. And the use of the funds is prescribed and there's a lengthy terms and condition document that you can read through to understand what those conditions are. There are different ones for each one of these distributions and the how you use the funds is subject to audit. And non-compliance with those terms and conditions can cause you to, um, to have the funds or the government recoup those funds from you. So that's kind of an overview of those funds. Now, if we look at um, the next slide, we have uh, this kind of illustrates the $100 billion in total grants that should, are to be distributed. Um, the first ball here is the $50 billion general distribution funds. And those began to be released, as I said, in on April 10th. And they were released to providers who build Medicare fee-for-service, not Medicare Advantage, but Medicare fee, regular Medicare 
claims in 2019 and um, were intended uh, to provide money for those that provide or provided after January 31st of 2020 diagnoses, testing, or care for individuals with possible or actual cases of COVID-19. And that's an important distinction there. The second uh, ball is a $12 million that um, the next four are related to the targeted distributions. And here's what we know so far. We know that $12 million will be distributed um, to high impact areas, areas that have had a lot of, uh, um, you know, New York would be an example, New Jersey, where they've had a high impact uh, effect of COVID-19 patients in their, in their population. Um, and then um, there's $2 billion of that, $10 billion for that, and then $2 billion of the 12 will go to uh, hospitals that receive disproportionate share payments. Uh, these are hospitals that take care of a, um, a large or a predominant, a, a, a good, a larger than normal segment of um, patients who don't have insurance or don't have coverage. Then we have $10 billion that are going to rural providers, and these include um, uh, critical access hospitals, rural acute hospitals, uh, rural health clinics, including clinics that um, don't take any Medicare and deal with pediatrics, such as pediatric rural health clinics, and community access, uh, critical access hospitals. And then we have $400 million that was uh, distributed or will be distributed to Indian health facilities. And then we have this 27 billion or so that is, is still um, outstanding. And they, the only thing that we know so far about this is that it's been, it will be distributed based on HHS's thought process at this moment to skilled nursing facilities, dentists, providers that take only Medicaid, and um, et cetera. So those are the clues that we have um, so far. And um, these CARES Act, on the next slide, the CARES Act Provider Relief Funds. Right at the top, we put the statement that's a quote from the frequently asked questions. And, and um, this states that HHS views every patient as a possible case of COVID-19. So that means that these funds can be used even though you haven't had an actual case of COVID-19 or a presumptive case or a possible case. It's, it's um, a presumptive case, someone with symptoms. Um, any uh, patient is considered a possible case of COVID-19. And when you receive the funds, you have to attest to the terms and conditions, and there are different ones for each distribution that, that you receive. Um, you have to submit also general revenue information, and um, you also are limited in terms of what you can collect from patients who have actual or presumptive cases of COVID-19. So if you're treating um, someone who has an active case of COVID-19 and they're in your facility and you're an out of network provider for that particular patient, then you are limited to collecting from the patient what their normal uh, copay responsibility would be if they had gone to an in network provider. And this is probably one of the questions we get most often is this reporting obligation for, for recipients who got more than $150,000 of relief funds. And um, the reason why this is such a concern, I'm sure, uh, is because the secretary of the Department of HHS has not yet defined exactly what form these reports will take or what kind of information specifically you have to include. Um, that is going to be published in the future by the secretary and you will be obligated if you receive that $150,000 or more in these relief funds, then you are obligated to um, make these quarterly reports to the Department of HHS, to the secretary. And you're also obligated to um, file those reports with what a new committee that is entitled the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee. And um, these quarterly reports, the first one is due July 10th. And um, to some of you that might be um, a little intimidating given that we don't actually have the reporting structure yet, but we're gonna try to give you some clues as to how you can prepare yourself to be able to um, file those reports when they become, um, when they become necessary. Claudia, 
before before we go on, it might be good to just touch back because I, I think this is an area where we I know we've gotten a lot of questions. Do you you want to maybe touch on a little more about the um, the difference between the definition of presumptive cases as it regards to the eliminate the the limits on balance billing and the definition of possible cases because the possible cases I understand it kind of defines the use of funds the presumptive definition really applies directly to the balance billing prohibition and that's just an important distinction because yeah. I know we've had a lot of clients ask about that yeah so there is a prohibition against balance billing when you are treating someone who is an actual or presumptive case of COVID-19 um, your uh, there's a program that will pay you for uninsured cases and um, if you accept the Medicare reimbursement. So in those cases, you're precluded from doing any balance billing um, in that situation. And so, in a presumptive case, the, the difference there is while HHS broadly has defined all patients are, are all, all patients as possible cases, a presumptive case is someone who has actually received it's either actual where they've actually received a COVID-19 diagnosis or a presumptive case where the patient's record would indicate a COVID-19 diagnosis, even in the absence of an actual test. Right. Okay. That's all. Okay. And um, it, as we said, and um, there are, there are 50, the $50 billion, which is the general distribution. These are um, not targeted funds. These are, going out to anyone, any provider who received um, the initial tranche, went out to medic patients who received Medicaid, Medicare fee-for-service uh, revenue or billed Medicare uh, the fee-for-service program. And um, this first, what they refer to these, they refer to these at the government level as tranches. So the first tranche was $30 billion. And those payments started to come out on Friday, April 10th. And uh, we had a number of calls from providers who said, I got this big check in my account. It says it's from Medicare. I'm not quite sure what it is <laughs> because these funds had been released pretty quickly um, within 14 days of the, the actual CARES Act being signed into law because the uh, Department of HHS felt like they, that they understood providers were really suffering as a result of the COVID pandemic. And they wanted to get money out there as quickly as possible and so they figured that the easiest way to do that would be to release funds based on each provider, each supplier's um, Medicare billings uh, during the calendar year 2018. So, I'm sorry, 2019. And um, they started to be released on April 10th, and by April 17th, they had completed that distribution of the initial $30 billion. And um, then they had a remainder of, 50, of $20 billion out of the 50 that was still available for distribution. The original intent of the law was to pay these general distribution amounts based on the net um, net healthcare revenues of each um, entity in as a percentage of total healthcare revenues. Uh, so the um, when they issued the second tranche of funds, the $20 billion, these amounts were initially distributed on April 24th for those individuals who, or providers who are obligated to file an annual full cost report. And um, they used the cost reports in, uh, that were filed in 2018 to determine what each provider's total healthcare, provider, healthcare related revenues were and they distributed that $20 billion based on um, a total amount of, uh, of healthcare related revenues in the industry as a whole. So those funds out, went out on April 24th and they're still continuing today. Now providers who do not um, have a cost report that they submit um, or did not submit a cost report, a full cost report to the Medicare program, then they are required to submit um, revenue information uh, through the attestation portal in order to support a payment from that second tranche of $20 billion. And in fact, all providers who received funds from this general distribution are going to be re obligated to submit revenue data. So even though they know how much you build the Medicare program, and even though they may have your Medicare cost report data that shows your total 
um, healthcare related revenues, patient revenues, they are still going to require that everyone submit revenue data as part of the attestation process. Claudia, just uh, I know one question we've gotten from a number of providers has been, um, you know, we've had some providers who have reached out and said, I think I was overpaid. In other words, I got more in the first tranche than the than based on 2019 Medicare fee for service billings than the uh, than the second formula, which is based on 2018 net patient revenue would would otherwise allow. And I know we have we've seen some very informal guidance from DHHS. Um, well, the formal guidance in the form of the frequently asked questions, which states that um, if a if a client feels like they've been overpaid, they should reject the funds. But there's been some clarification from DHHS where they mean overpayment in the form of if you think the calculation was performed incorrectly, meaning the original 2019 Medicare fee for service calculation was performed incorrectly. If the calculation was performed correctly and you received more than the second formula would give you simply because of the ratio of your Medicare billings to your other billings, you, you're not obligated to return those funds. That's right. And there were some providers and even some classes of providers that fell into that group. For example, um, we've heard anecdotally that home health agencies um, felt like they were receiving perhaps a greater share of the funds than what they, of the, uh, more than what they would have expected to receive. And um, then you also have some providers who um, may have sold their business or their practice and still got um, a distribution from this fund, even though they're no longer providing any services um, after, you know, say they sold their business in 2019 and they're not providing services any longer in 2020, so they wouldn't be treating any possible cases of COVID-19. So in those cases, there was a lot of confusion about what they should do with that, but that was one of the um, clarifications that the Department of HHS issued within the last few days um, saying that, no, if you got a distribution and you no longer own the provider and you're not providing um, patient services anymore, then you need to return that, those funds. You wouldn't want to keep them. You wouldn't want to turn them over to the new owner. Uh, they make it very specific that you have to return those funds. And there is, as an addition to that, there is also one of the additional changes was there is now a mechanism outlined in the frequently asked questions for the acquiring entity that acquired the practice and maybe did not get compensated because because of this situation. They um, there is a mechanism by which they can report those revenues to DHHS and hopefully receive the appropriate. Right. There's yeah. a there is a mechanism for them, and I think you know the changes that are occurring. The frequently asked questions that we've talked about, they were updated yesterday. So when you look at the frequently asked questions, if you pulled them a week or two ago, it's almost something you want to check every day because those questions will include the question and an answer, and it will also state the date that that has been revised or added. So you can check to see has anything been added since yesterday, um, May uh, 20th, um, just to make sure something you either want to check or make sure you're getting up to date information very regularly. Yeah. I, I just and one more add on there before we go, and I don't want to, but you know, that not only were they just updated yesterday, they actually been updated, I think, four times in the last week. And so <laughs> it is almost something that we would recommend everybody, you know, have somebody in your office. I would actually check them and actually pull down and save a copy every day because not only do they change not only are they updated but sometimes they actually change and if you make a decision or take an action based on an earlier frequently asked question that then have you have the guidance change on it, it's going to be very helpful to go back and demonstrate that you took an action based on the guidance that was available at the time the fact that it subsequently changed is you know um you know you don't have any control over that so anyway i just wanted to point that out as well. yeah it's well, really perhaps we should I was just going to say, perhaps we should admit to everyone that we checked them this morning <laughs> to be yes. prepared for this because it, it's living. happened to us yeah, after preparing slides. Yeah, we've been living in these websites. So if you're 
if you get confused over all of these, and I don't know how unless you, you know, read them practically all day long, you, you know, would be expected to have some confusion. Please don't hesitate to reach out because it's a monumental task, I, I think it's fair to say, for us to, uh, to try to stay on top of all of this. All right. Um, Al, you want to take the next slide? Uh, thank you, and I want to say uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, this this particular slide, as Claudia mentioned previously, the second tranche is basically ongoing, if you would. And uh, so through uh, May 13th, this is an illustration of the funds, the CARES funds distributed, uh, distributed, excuse me, across the country, totally for the U.S. That works out to be um, 34 billion of the amount. We wanted to throw up all 50 states. Uh, however, the, the we couldn't make the formatting work. So since we're based in the southeast, we went through and selected some southern states and have put up there, as you can see, uh, in the case of Florida through the 13th, it had been over uh, uh, 2 billion uh, distributed. And these are attested funds. These are uh, providers that have gone through the attestation. I, uh, not on this screen, but uh, of the 34 billion, California's received the most, which comes to be expected given their size and the number of providers, had a touch over 3 billion. And in the states, uh, Rhode Island has received the least amount of 99 million. Could we go on to the next one? Uh, there we go. Uh, this particular slide is uh, the data on the previous slide and this slide were obtained from uh, the website data.cdc.gov. Uh, there is a data set that is kept updated on that website that shows the uh, stimulus payments paid by provider. We want to illustrate that uh, it is available on the website. They have a mechanism that you can pull up and look by state, by city, by provider name, to see how much how many uh, funds have been uh, distributed to date or attested. Uh, this website uh, additionally has, and you can actually see it on the in the blue there, that has an export function. So if you're needing it for uh, uh, additional informational purposes, you can download the data set to your uh, local computer in an Excel CSV format. And that way you can sort it and uh, search it as you need to for your particular uh, devices. Uh, I think, it, Claudia, Andrew, anything else on the uh, relief? No, I, Al, just, just a couple of things to point out, because I know we've had some clients ask us about this. When you accept the terms and conditions, you're agreeing to the release of this data and the publication of this data. And, you know, just in the recent update, yesterday's Frequently Asked Questions update, uh, there was a, a specific item addressing that providers cannot choose to have their data omitted. So if you if you accept the funds, you're basically on the hook for having them released. So now we're going to move on to the attestation requirements. And uh, Claudia, I think you have the next slide. Okay, so the attestations. This is where a lot of uh, people have been spending their time, I think, here recently. Um, every tranche out of the 50 billion, the tranche number one and tranche number two, requires a separate um, attestation and has separate and, and slightly different terms and conditions that are associated with each one, each of those tranche payments. So um, the first tranche was issued on April 10th and the second tranche began on April 24th. And just recently, uh, the Department of HHS extended the due date or the deadline for attesting um, to the receipt of these funds. So the attest attestations are now due 45 days from the date you received your funds uh, via ACH or electronically to your bank directly, um, as most providers did. And there were some providers that got a check, an actual paper check, and um, those, have, uh, those attestations are due within 60 days of the date of receipt. So the earliest date that you want to keep on your radar, if you received, as did most providers, uh, an initial payment of the general distribution on April 10th, then you are required to go in and attest, read the terms and conditions, 
and uh, go through the attestation process, which is on a portal on the HHS website. And you should do that by May 25th. If you don't do that, then they assume that you're accepting the funds and it's as if you did go in and complete the attestation. So the second tranche of funds began to be issued on April 24th. So the 45 uh, day due date um, for the attestation for that second uh, distribution, the earliest date would be June 8th of 2020. Um, so each attestation is going to require that you have available so you can confirm and input this information is the amount of each of the payments. So when you do your um, go through the attestation process before May 25th, you want to document or uh, have available how much you actually received from the first tranche, the payments that went out uh, to that $30 billion. And you want to have the bank account into which it was deposited. And then you're going to be asked to attest or agree with the applicable terms and conditions. When you look at those terms and conditions, probably the first two or three pages are specific to this particular grant program but then they bring in another probably seven pages or more of um, requirements that are more general in nature that apply to any federal grant. Um, things like you can't be involved in trafficking or pornography or cocaine distribution, <laughs> uh, bribery, et cetera. So um, there's uh, quite a bit that is included in that terms and conditions um, and the attestation process. And there's a portal that you go to, and we have the link here for you, um, on the hhs.gov website that is, uh, contains the attestation portal where you go to make your general distribution attestations. Claudia, before we, before we go on to the next slide, which ties in with the attestations and is talking about the financial data that all providers need to submit, we probably should mention we discussed bringing up the fact that yesterday in the in the frequently asked questions that were published actually wasn't even in the frequently asked questions it's in a a, a news release on the dhhs website there is a there is another date of june 3rd which is right around the corner and so for providers who either did not receive a payment in the second tranche or feel like they should be eligible for additional funds through the second tranche the 45 or 60 day attestation deadline standing those providers who are looking for additional funds from the second tranche must attest and upload the information on or before june 3rd 2020. right and as you said that just came out yesterday so they have a little bit more time to submit whatever documentation they need to in order to get uh, funds from the second tranche and I will, I think we will all readily admit that we don't know where they came up with June 3rd. It's not 45 <laughs> days from anything, so the, uh, but that'll just be one of those little mysteries. Um, and I think people may feel like they don't know where they came up with a lot of this that, um, <laughs> that we're talking about today. So, um, you know, this is certainly a situation that is um, unique, you know, for someone who's been in the business for more than 30 years, um, you know, you've never seen anything like this. And I think um, we're very glad that that's the case, but um, this is, we're, we're blazing new territory here, and so is the federal government. So once you submit the, the um, uh, submit your attestation, then you have to submit some additional information. Um, and this is going to enable um, Department of HHS to take a look at your patient revenues compared to all patient re revenues nationwide and kind of true up or reevaluate the payments that they have um, distributed through tranche one and tranche two to get it as close as possible to each entity's percentage of net patient revenues. So, when you accept, you will also have to go in and um, enter revenue data for the calendar year 2018. And another important piece is that you have to estimate your lost revenue through March and April of 2020. This particular question, I think, is one that we've gotten so many, you know, so many people being um, concerned about that they didn't want to overestimate. They're not quite sure what factors to take into consideration. And um, and it, it's a very important estimate, I think, that you need to be looking at before you submit the information to the um, uh, financial portal. 
So the government has said that you can, when you make these estimates of lost revenue in March 2020 and April 2020, that what you're looking at, this is lost revenue. This is not net income, it's lost revenue. So it's the top line. What has happened to your, to your revenue line since um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic uh, and the public health emergency was declared? So the guidelines say you can use any reasonable method of estimating the revenue during March and April. You can compare it to the same period um, for last year, and uh, which probably is not the best way to go, but that's one way you can, you can one particular factor you will want to look at. Another thing they have said <clears throat> is you can budget, you can use budgeted revenues. What would you have expected your March and April revenues, um, total revenues to look like if COVID-19 hadn't occurred? And so you may have prepared a budget that you were operating under for COVID-19. And um, so that's another factor you can look at. But there are so many, for example, we know in the nursing home side, we went to a new payment system in 2019. We went under the PDPM payment system. And that may have affected your Medicare revenues, which are a piece of this. It may have affected you in ways that, um, that where a year to year comparison is not necessarily appropriate. Um, it may also be that um, you have other circumstances. Maybe you opened additional beds or you certified additional Medicare beds or you added you know, you, you added a new program or, or whatever. So there may be a significant difference to where you are today or where you would have expected to be in March and April. So another way you can approach this is looking at what your revenues look like in February, your total net revenues, and use that to project based on January or February, what your revenues might have looked like and where the trends were heading and what you might have expected during March and April. I think one of the more common issues we've seen with this is a tendency to underestimate, um, just taking a look at last year and this year and deciding that that's probably what your revenue loss might be. So uh, I think this is a very important piece and will be an ongoing um, obligation um, as the pandemic, for as long as the pandemic continues. All right, no, I'll, I'll agree. And, and my only add there would be, you know, if you're if you're struggling with this, you know, we're we're strongly recommending, uh, you know, providers reach out to their CPA, reach out to their their consultant. You know, make sure you're taking in, as Claudia just walked through, all of the factors, all of the uh, all of the considerations. Uh, <clears throat> you should be in estimating lost revenue because you're going to cut. You're going to see that we come back to this lost revenue question when we talk about how the funds can be used and you're going to continue to need to report on lost revenues um, going forward or at least the providers who have reporting requirements and i i think it's really important to remember it's not net income you know some questions have come up, yeah. well, what if we use ppp money does that affect how we estimate our lost revenues and it doesn't because the ppp um funds relate to expenses just oversimplifying probably but net revenues is not you have expenses you have um, revenues and you have net income so um, what this is talking about is the top line or your total net revenue and how much total net revenue do you believe you can reasonably estimate that you have lost um, in this as a result of this pandemic in March and April of 2020 so and, and uh, people might feel a little conservative because this is going to the federal government and we don't want to be audited. <laughs> so we might be a little too conservative when it comes up to estimating this. And I think as long as you have solid grounds um, and uh, good backup for what you're doing and rational decision making, then um, you, you want to make sure you're really representing that number properly, as Andrew said. Excellent. All right. So the next couple slides just go over some of the, the general, the terms and conditions for the general distributions. And so to keep us on track, we'll go through these fairly quickly. Most of these are folks are already somewhat familiar with, but to be eligible, as Claudia said earlier, you must have billed Medicare in 2019. Um, the, you're required to, uh, you're required also as part of eligibility, it's required that you 
provided or have uh, provide testing, diagnosis, or care to individuals with possible or actual cases of COVID-19. Um, you can have been terminated from Medicare or precluded from receiving payments or have, your, have had your billing, pay, billing privileges revoked. Um, you must certify that the payment will be used to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the coronavirus. Um, and that the payment shall only be used to reimburse for healthcare related expenses or lost revenues attributed to coronavirus. And we were just talking about the calculation of lost revenue. Um, you must certify that the payment will not be used to reimburse for expenses or losses that have been or will be reimbursed for other sources. And this ties into one of the questions that Claudia was just referring to. We had a client reach out to us and ask, well, you know, does this prevent me from seeking replacement of lost revenue during the same period in which my payroll protection loan is paying for my payroll expense? And the answer is no, because you're, as Claudia said, your payroll protection loan is covering expenses. Uh, you could still report back that you're using these funds to replace lost revenue, which is your 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 the dollars before any expenses are paid. So um, so that that's an important uh, clarification. Um, obviously, you have to certify that the information provided is true and correct. And um, we've also talked about the the prohibition on balance billing and how it applies only to presumptive or actual cases and how, you know, just keep in mind that there's a different definition for presumptive and possible. Um, so moving on from there, uh, once again, use of funds, important to note that the use of funds is retroactive back to January 31st of 2020. So as you, um, as you are looking at tracking, and we're gonna talk about tracking and accounting for these items, you're gonna be tracking the both of the, the lost revenue and the increase in um, in healthcare related expenses beginning February 1st and then carrying forward. And right now, based on the guidance we currently have, there's no end date for that tracking. So you'll the expectation is that you'll continue starting February 1st and you'll continue to track your lost revenue, continue to track your increased expenses until you've um, exhausted the CARES provider relief funding that you received. Um, we've talked a little bit about how the funds can be used already and how HHS has stated on their website and in the frequently asked questions that they view every patient as a possible case of COVID-19. Um, and we've talked about the replacement of lost revenue. Um, the, uh, our quality, anything that, that y'all would want to add to those that we haven't already covered? Just that it's, you know, when you look back, it's particularly nursing homes with all of the regulatory requirements that have come up and that they've had to contend with and all the shortages of PPE and staffing issues and um, hazard pay and other sorts of things. There is a lot there that you want to make sure you begin to track from, you know, from February 1st forward and uh, because it's probably a lot more than what you anticipate. And that's a nice transition to this slide where we just tried to show some examples of what we think could be possible COVID-19 related healthcare expenses. So as Claudia mentioned, PPP, you know, it's obviously been a big, big news item for the last two and a half or three months is the availability of PPE, what clients are having to pay for, you know, what nursing homes are having to pay for PPE, um, staff time and supplies for deep cleaning, trace service for all resident meals. Um, you know, trace service is interesting. We had clients who, you know, have had to have their accounting team or their administrative team come in and help meet their trace service requirements. Track that time, even though those are salaried individuals, you might not normally be capturing their time, but but capture that time. And, you know, there are ways to allocate a salaried individual's cost per hour because, you know, if they were taken away from their normal duties to meet, you know, to check people in and out of the building or to meet disinfection needs or to meet tray service needs or to assist the dietary staff. Those are those are things that you can include and report back as uses for um, you know COVID-19 related patient care expenses. Um, staff time dedicated to coordinate COVID-19 responses, visitor screening, infection control. Once again, these are just some items where we're encouraging our clients to look and see if you can identify expenses in these areas. All right, Al, you want to take a few minutes um, and 
talk about what we feel are some of the best practices for COVID-19 accounting. Sure thing. Uh, as uh, you can imagine for uh, the situation where we don't even know the end game, we don't know what the reporting requirements are going to be, uh, how we account for it, how we uh, track our tracking mechanism in place, it's going to be uh, somewhat individualized. I don't know that one one size fits all in the industry or certainly for skilled nursing or home health or other post-acute repairs. Uh, we've gotten together and tried to come up with our uh, the best approach based upon years of experience of dealing with government programs and their reporting requirements. And our consensus is pretty much that, and uh, when you've gone and attended other webinars or uh, investigated across the web, uh, certainly one of the most prominent is that the recommendation is that you separate out in, on your GL, at least, uh, the cash and deferred income uh, accounts for these proceeds that you receive by fund so that uh, uh, they are segregated. You don't necessarily have to have a separate bank account per se, but to track it separately on your general ledger and have a separate general GL account number. Uh, we, looking at time studies, and this goes back a little bit to the previous slide, what uh, Andrew was uh, speaking about trace service. When time studies, you want to record both the employee's standard duties, what it is their job description entails and what they normally do, and then track and record the amount of time spent on additional activities that have been prompted by the COVID reaction to the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, over time, uh, as far as it's concerned, uh, could be also tracked to the extent that it's required because of COVID-19. Now, if you have someone that is consistently had overtime, that means that uh, if you're demonstrating it for uh, tracking purposes, what uh, what additional COVID-19 uh, responses have been caused? In other words, doing cleanup after shift, uh, additional cleanup duties assisting other departments. Uh, Carving out employee sick leave time for a due to personal or family COVID-19 illness from their normal sick leave or their standard sick leave request, such as a doctor's, a scheduled doctor's appointment. Uh, if you're utilizing a group purchasing organization, which is, you know, certainly goes across whether it's healthcare providers or uh, outside of healthcare, uh, if you're having to purchase a document, uh, having to purchase supplies, excuse me, outside the GPO because they don't have access to them, and you're having to out outsource it, find another supplier, then uh, be, besides tracking the cost, track the methodology. How did you determine that uh, supplier? Any bids that you set out to uh, keep just keep those on file to be able to substantiate uh, how you came up with those amounts. Uh, on to the next one, I believe the next slide, there we go. Now, there's some provider counting systems, even though uh, most systems today are fairly uh, sophisticated, uh, the accounting packages. But some providers uh, feel their accounting systems are either not flexible enough or they consider it too onerous to go through and set up and track the uh, additional expenses due to the, the COVID-19 response to separate GL sub accounts uh, to segregate those related expenses there. Uh, they feel like it, they can't take it through the uh, normal uh, AP system. If that's the case, then they may elect to set up the transactions and uh, track them on an Excel spreadsheet, uh, which has been uh, advocated you know, by numerous uh, sources. Or you may choose to do both. Uh, in, in this particular case, uh, when you're looking to do both, 
uh, you're going to con uh, continue to uh, record your expenses as you normally would through GL. Uh, you, you, your expenses need to hit your GL, but then you can use the Excel spreadsheet to track the outliers, the amounts that had to be spent to meet the COVID-19 response. Uh, many of you may have seen uh, a version of an Excel uh, spreadsheet that's out there or heard of it that had been developed for AHCA and it's available to members through their website. It's quite extensive in the amount of detail that is information that they expect to be recorded. Uh, some of you may have already started keeping your own Excel spreadsheets uh, to track this information and it's uh, keeping it more basic. Right now, until there is guidance for uh, how to track and report these elements, there really isn't a wrong approach, except that you do nothing. You are going to have to track these amounts. Uh, when looking at uh, the uh, expenses that you record on your Excel spreadsheets, uh, the, documenting the time for soured employees and staff that did, just as Andrew specified in an earlier uh, discussion, uh, that went and helped out in dietary. The, the elements that you're carving out to show that uh, to meet the COVID-19 response would go on and be tracked up on the Excel spreadsheet. Additional contract services, such as deep cleaning services, any external services that you had to have. Uh, if you have to employ additional consultants to help you meet the accounting requirements that are the administrative requirements that are thrown up by uh, the, the government's reporting requirements, uh, you would record those. Uh, and also, you'd want to track the drawdown of each fund, almost like your checkbook. You would like you do with a check record in that seeing the uh, allowable expenses being away coming away from the amounts that you've recorded as received so that you're keeping a running balance you can use that for budgeting and planning purposes uh, for the uh, foreseeable future if we could advance to the next one there we go now one of the elements that uh, was alluded to earlier by Claudia was the quarterly reporting requirement. So, and what we do know is that uh, recipients of 150,000 or more, they shall submit quarterly reports. What we also know is that if you receive less than $150,000 or don't meet that threshold, you are still must be able to submit reports upon request. So it, it almost necessitates that we all uh, track and take seriously the reporting requirement, uh, regardless of the amount of funds that you receive. But you have to receive 150,000 or more and to know that you have to, uh, but they still retain, as the government always does, the ability to come in and request documentation uh, as needed. Among the things that we don't know in this particular situation is what are the reports supposed to look like? So uh, we are uh, continually, uh, as, as Claudia and Andrew spoke to earlier, we're constantly moderating, moderating uh, monitoring the websites. Uh, if you uh, have questions along those regards, if you haven't seen anything, Feel free to shoot us emails uh, just to check up periodically if we've seen anything. Once we do find out, we will be addressing the situation uh, with everyone. Now, the uh, one highlighted point that is here among the uh, information that is noted, all that was shown so far on reports is that they shall be in such form with such content as specified by the secretary in future program instructions. And right now, that's the most we know. Uh, now, yeah, uh, Cla Claudia mentioned, I believe it's Claudia, the Pandemic Response Account Accountability Committee. Well, since we're dealing with the government here, you knew there had to be a committee somewhere. And so this is a, uh, a 
new committee set up. It has its own uh, budget established. These funds coming through the uh, the act, eighty million dollars is available to fund the committee expenses, which are the object stated objections are promoting transparency, uh, some uh, prevent and detect fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement, mitigate major risks. This is has an end date for this committee as of 9-30-2025. So for another five years, there'll be a committee that's out there that potentially could contact us with regard to how we spent these funds. Uh, they have their own website. It's pandemic.oversight.gov, kind of figures. Uh, and it's worth the visit because they have a cool pie chart on there that shows you the allocation of the funds to date uh, where they were to go to and uh, the various segments that were impacted. Andrew, you know, Claudia? You know you're talking to accountants when you hear the term cool pie chart. The uh, So Al, thank you. I, I have to time. grasp at straws when reading this stuff. So we've got a couple minutes for questions here at the end. Um, just real quick before we start on the, on the questions, um, we will, we do expect to be hosting a follow up to this webinar as we get into June at some point and the, um, and we get more guidance on the, the final reporting format. So keep that in mind. We, we are, you know, looking at probably the, the third or fourth week of June for a follow up on this with the expectation that at some point, since our first reporting deadline is July 10th, the government's going to have to tell us how they want the data. So Al and Claudia, a couple questions just to start us off. Um, uh, we had a client ask, do you have to have COVID-19 patients to accept funds? Claudia, you want to take that? I think we've touched on it already, but. Yeah, we, um, yes, I think that's an important um, point to remember that you do not have to actually have a COVID-19 patient in order to accept these funds. So you're preparing um, for accepting a patient and the government has also said, Department of HHS has said multiple places that they view every uh, patient as a potential COVID-19 case. Well, and as uh, as you pointed out earlier, uh, you're, you're going to incur expenses just to meet the CDC guidelines in your buildings and in your businesses, and those have been mandated. You, you, so the, the potential there is that uh, some individuals, some providers will sit there and say, well, I don't have a COVID-19 case, so I really don't qualify or don't have to do this. No, you're incurring additional extraordinary expenses that you didn't have to occur in January. All, all great points. Um, we, had, uh, we had a client ask how they can determine the status of any additional grants related to the remaining $20 billion of the CARES Provider Relief Fund. And, uh, you know, Claudia, I can take this with you. We outlined for you what we know about those funds. There's still a substantial piece as the, as the, the our client, our, the question asked here, of, of funds that have not yet been determined. And your best source for that is to monitor the DHHS uh, COVID-19 website. That information is, you know, coming out in real time, um, constantly, and uh, you know, with what we have right now is the, is what we know is that the funds are going to be used for you know uninsured patients, for the high risk areas, uh, Indian Health Services, some of those other items that that Claudia outlined. Um, Jamie, I know you've been monitoring the chat, and so we've got just another minute or two. Any any other questions from our chat group? Yes, we've gotten a few actually. Some you guys may want to follow up uh, with these individuals for specifics offline, but I do want to share one uh, question around clarification around PPP funding and then this provider relief funding. How can those be applied? Is there any double dipping that people need to be concerned about? Can we touch on that and maybe elaborate? Uh, we've got a couple questions specifically around that. And if, if you guys want to open up the chat, you can see. Yeah, and so I, I can 
I can start there and then Claudia or I'll just feel free to jump in. But yeah, Claudia touched on this earlier. So you can't double dip. Um, and so, you know, big picture, what that means is that if you're tracking, but if you're tracking labor costs associated with, um, you know, with your COVID-19 response for that eight week period that is covered by your PPP loan, when you get to report, when you come around to the reporting requirement for your CARES relief funds, you, you won't be able to include those payroll costs that were covered by PPP in your reporting as a, as a use of your CARES money. So lost revenue, completely okay, because PPP does not cover a lot, replace lost revenue, it replaces direct expenses. But, you know, let's say you're tracking, you're tracking staff time, um, you know, for the additional time involved with, with checking people in and out of the building. Well, to the extent that you've got people doing that during your eight week PPP loan period, you can't use those labor hours for your ultimate reporting on um, as, as, a, as a use of your COVID-19 funds. Claudia or Al, does that, I mean. It might be good to point it to talk about what happens when the eight week period is over. You know. yeah, once the eight week period is over, yeah, you could have, you know, so once your PP, PP, once your PPP funds are fully exhausted and, and you, you're not seeking for forgiveness of that piece, then you will have, you know, you those labor costs after that eight week period and before the eight week period are all includable as costs that you can track and report back to the government as a use of the CARES funds. Jamie, anything else? All I know right. we're, just, we, we're a little over, so. Yeah, we are, and just in the interest uh, of time, let's go ahead and, um, that that really covered the majority of the questions that we received. There's another specific one. We'll go ahead and follow up with that one offline. I think that would be best. Yeah, we'll, we'll, so, we'll review all the questions and follow up with everybody individually. So, sure. um, yeah, okay. uh, just a, a couple more. We included some key references in the slide deck. And then, uh, Jamie, you want to touch briefly on the last two, and then we'll let everybody get back to what I'm sure is their busy day. Yes. So before we before we conclude really quickly, I did mention at the beginning of our presentation, all of the materials from today will be sent to you. They're also going to be loaded uh, to our COVID-19 resource hub, which is home to all kinds of other information, which you might find uh, interesting on this subject. So please feel free to check that page out for lots of great information. And then uh, next week, we're going to be doing a follow up to our PPP session, which we began last week. Obviously, more information has been released, um, some some more guidance, and then of course, that application form as well. So um, if you're free next Thursday, please, please feel free to join us. We'd love to have you uh, information on our seminars page, you see a link there if you'd like to sign up to join us. And with that, uh, we thank you all for for coming this afternoon and hope you took something from this i i know i sure did so thank you all again and thank you to our healthcare team for sharing uh your wealth of information with us and we hope to see you all again soon and from the healthcare team uh, just want to say thank you to all our clients and friends who took the time to join us we hope you found it interesting as well hope you feel like you walked away with something please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or follow-up Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.